Well, welcome back to Media Pressure. I'm your host, Julie Murray. And today we are giving you a bonus episode. We are going to answer some of the questions that people have sent in. There was no way that I was going to be able to get to every detail and cover 20 years of an investigation. So I knew that there would be questions and I thought this was a cool way for some listener interaction. But most importantly, I want to thank all the listeners for liking, sharing, listening, telling a friend about the podcast. The response has been overwhelming. And I didn't really know what to expect going into this. I just knew I wanted to do a good job for Mara. I wanted to eliminate some of the speculation, which I think I have done. And I really wanted to just put Mara back at the center of her own story. And after seeing all the responses and comments, I think, I think we did that with this. So let me introduce Sarah Turney. She is the executive producer and mastermind of Media Pressure. And thanks to her, this was possible. So I just want to kick it over to you, Sarah, and ask, what did you expect? And what is your response to the support that we've gotten? Oh, my goodness. Well, hi. Um, first, I wasn't exactly sure what to expect. I'm not going to lie. I was a little nervous um, in putting this out because I know that this case in particular has such a target on its back, for lack of a better word. But the response... and. And really, let me go back because I was nervous for you. I didn't want this to cause any more pain or any more hurt for your whole family. So that was my biggest concern. I had no concerns about the content, obviously, but I was so excited and so happy when the overall response was so overwhelmingly positive. People were cheering you on. People were cheering your dad on, uh, cheering your whole family on. And that made me so excited for you because... That was a similar experience to what I had in season one of Voices for Justice. And my best hope for you and your whole family was really just for you to be surrounded by that same love that I was, and you definitely were. So I am just over the moon, so excited and so grateful to you, your whole family, and to everyone who listened. Yep, I agree. I agree. And one of the hard things was, you know, my dad has a lot to say. And I recorded eight hours with my dad and I couldn't possibly fit all of that into the podcast, but it gave him an opportunity and also everybody else in my family and everybody that came on the show, just a chance to tell their experience, their story in this, because most of the people I interviewed either knew Mara or had a hand in the investigation. And We've never had a podcast put together that kind of gave them space to to tell their their story and their experiences. And so although I didn't use all of the eight hours <laughs> that my dad um, provided me, uh, it was a good outlet for him to get all of that off his chest. And of course, I have it all still. And, and there were points early on in, you know, the first couple hours of the interview with my dad where I would hit pause and kind of be like, dad, stay on track. Like (laughs) you just answered the question. But then as it went on, I stopped, I stopped pausing. And I was like, I'm going to let him say what he, what he wants to say and whether I use it or not, it doesn't matter. And that was very, very therapeutic for him to do that. And um, he's just so proud and everybody in my family is so proud. And you know, once once we finished it, you know, right before launch, we kind of all got together and we're like, we looked at each other and we thought Mara would be proud of us for this. And that's the most important thing. And that's really what I wanted to convey. And, you know, I didn't know that it was going to be top of the charts. I didn't expect that. And to be honest, that wasn't the point. Yeah. I'm very, very happy that people listened and it did hit top of the charts and it's still on the charts now. But the overall point was do right by Mara. And everybody in my family feels 
feels that feels like we did a good job. I love that so much. Um, I had the chance to meet your family at the 20 year vigil. And that was one of the coolest experiences for me because I've heard about all these people for so many years. I've seen how absent your family has been in the media in this story and not by any fault of your own, but just in general. So getting to meet everybody and being there and feeling that energy and meeting all these people who have been with the case long before I have was so magical and so special and really just solidified everything we're doing here today. And I'm I'm just so glad that you were able to put this together and kind of let me handle that piece of worrying about how popular it was in the charts or the marketing behind it. Because you've already done so much, you've had to deal with so much in terms of just making this podcast that I just really wanted to play that support role for you. So I'm like, so glad that you said that and you can just take a back seat and I can worry about all the the super high pressure um, items that go into marketing a podcast. And yeah, I mean, I was thrilled when we hit number one. I was shocked because I don't think people realize that um, our biggest contender was really call her daddy, right? She had just gone exclusive. Um, or I'm sorry, she just broke her exclusivity with Spotify and came over to Apple. And I was like, I don't know, Julie, I don't know if we're going to beat call her daddy. That's such a tall order. And then we did. And it was just fantastic. And again, that wouldn't have happened without all of you guys listening out there today. So I just want to say thank you for believing, one, in this concept, two, in family-led true crime content, and three, just for believing in Julie as much as I did. So thank you. And thank you, Julie. We could sit here and thank each other all day. We we really could. Yeah. (laughs) Let's not do that. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, with that being said, why don't we just go into the Q&A and I can kind of outline it for everybody. So there were about 200 questions that were submitted. And of course, like Julie said, we, we just can't get to them all. So we tried to outline this to make sense for everybody. The first set of questions is going to be related to the investigation, the second to theories, the third to the media impact of everything, four with the resolution, where things are today, next steps, and final words. And then we are ending with something very special that until this episode was only heard by a handful of people. So definitely stay tuned to the end. And Julie, are you ready for questions? I'm ready. Let's do it. (laughs) All right. As ready as you'll ever be, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So we're in section one, investigation. Question number one, were the calls from Mora's dorm ever traced? This is a great question. And it's something that I brought up to the former lead detective who had since retired. And his response to me was, we looked into that. And so... I certainly hope that those records were looked at because I think there could be some potential value in the dorm records because that's just a total unknown. But sitting here today, I don't know whether they have. Yeah. All right. Question number two. Who was slash is the contact that Mora had written down on a note in her car with their phone number? Do police have an explanation as to why they didn't look into that lead 20 years ago? Another great question. So obviously it would be irresponsible for me to name that person publicly and I didn't in the podcast, so I won't do that. But authorities did tell me that they are aware, which is kind of frustrating because I don't know whether they're aware because I made them aware or that they were aware back in 2004. So there's still some gray area as to when they were aware. And I can't answer why they never called this person, whether it be back in 2004 or over the course of 20 years. Because when I spoke to the person, that was the first time that anyone had reached out to them. And I asked them, has law enforcement ever reached out to you? And they said, no. So that was a huge, huge point of frustration for my family. And it also reinforces the reason why it's important for my family to kind of tra- trace all leads because we, we just don't know sometimes, but law enforcement is aware at this point. Next question. Mora's gas tank was nearly full when her car was found. Do you have any idea what gas station she may have stopped at? Do you believe cash was used? 
Well, we do know from the vehicle forensic report that her tank was nearly full. So we know that she must have stopped to get gas. So there's right off exit 91, which is the route that Mara would have taken to go up north. The exit that she would have gotten off at, there's a truck stop there. It's called P&H Truck Stop. And that's just one potential spot. There are a handful of other convenience stores slash gas stations between that point and where her car was found. So my family has gone to these locations and tried to speak with people that work there. And police have told us that they also went to those gas stations. And some of them, they pulled security footage. This next one is, why was that extra Chrysler part in her vehicle? Was it the same model of the suspicious vehicle that was reported? This is a great question, and I don't know the answer. So when I was aware that there was this random Chrysler part found in her car, that was from looking at the vehicle forensic report. And the piece, it kind of looks like a mirror but it doesn't have a part number. So we can't tie it to a particular vehicle. We just know it's from Chrysler. It had Chrysler stamped on the back of it. So that's all we know. Were scent dogs ever used on SUV 001? I don't believe the dogs searched uh, um, SUV 001, no. Has Sarah ever explained why she refuses to speak with you? No. And I just want to say right here that in this Q&A and for families in general, we're going to accept no as a full answer. There are sometimes, in any case, questions that families won't or can't answer for a variety of reasons. So I'm just throwing it out there now. No is a complete answer. Is there any unsearched land near the crash site? There is some private land that has not been searched And there's a number of different reasons for that, but mainly some of those landowners did not give us permission. But the areas that are public, of course, the road and all the public areas, those have all been searched probably at this point hundreds of times. And then there's a lot of the neighbors right there that were kind enough to grant my family permission to search. And we've done that as well. So I feel pretty confident that the areas that we're able to get to have been exhausted. Yeah. This next question, I was actually really curious about it when it came through because I thought it was fantastic. Were the serial numbers from the cash Mara took out of the ATM ever looked into to see if they're back in circulation? I also agree. That is a great question. And it's questions like those that get people talking and thinking because in 20 years, I don't, I don't recall ever being asked that or ever even thinking about that myself. And that's happened more than once since the launch of media pressure. Sadly, I don't know. So I don't know this far along how we could do that, but I love those questions, thinking outside of the box. Yeah, of course, giving you ideas for future meetings. And I actually, I did look this one up because I was like, is this even a thing? And it is. I didn't get as far back as was it a thing back then in that specific area, but you can, you can trace these bills coming from ATMs, which was news to me. So very interesting. We will be waiting for hopefully a a new answer in the future if you can track it, track it down. This was also a really excellent question. Did your dad, Mr. Fred Murray, notice any odors in Mora's car when he drove it? Well, I I just asked my dad to reconfirm and he said no. But I think it's important to note that when my dad saw the car, it was on Friday and he was sleep deprived. He was still in shock and panic mode. So there's a lot of things that... He doesn't remember. I know somebody asked, what was the seat position of the driver's seat? Was it further up as if Mara was driving or back? And those are things he just, he doesn't remember. 
Yeah. I mean, of course, who remembers what something smells like 20 years ago or what position a seat was in? I think a lot of people don't understand that when you actually go through something like this, especially 20 years ago, like both of us have, true crime wasn't really as prevalent and we didn't really have those true crime brains, if you will. So I don't think that anybody was like, I need to track every single aspect of what's going on because 20 years from now, this will be unsolved. I don't think anybody had that mindset. So that makes total sense to me. If somebody asked me what my sister's room smelled like 20 years ago when she went missing, I have no idea. Absolutely no idea. Our next question is probably one of the most asked. Can you discuss Bill's absence from the podcast and what your family's relationship with him is today, if any? Well, I did speak to Bill and asked him some questions for the podcast. Yeah, perfect. Period. (laughs) Yeah, period. Full sentence. I respect it. So in putting together the podcast, obviously, I wanted to and needed to fact check myself because there's so many facts and figures and names and locations um, in my brain, and I did my best to um, make sure what I was putting out was the truth, the factual. Um, but I am a human, and I do make mistakes. And I phrased something that caused some confusion, and I can see why it did that. So I just kind of want to take accountability and give some clarification. So at one point in the podcast, I said that Mara looked up directions to Vermont and New Hampshire. And I, the phrasing with that kind of gave people the impression that I I didn't want to, for them to have. So what we do know is that Mara looked up directions to Vermont and the Berkshires. So When I saw Berkshires, I was like, oh, the Berkshires, but that's in two states. So I asked detectives, which Berkshires, Vermont or um, Massachusetts? And they, they weren't sure. So then I asked them, how did Mara get the condo owner's number to call the condo in Bartlett? And the way that I interpreted their answer was that she looked up the Seasons Resort in Bartlett, New Hampshire. And so that's why I phrased it that way. So she didn't necessarily look up directions to New Hampshire. She looked up the seasons, if that makes sense. So it wasn't directions per se. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And I mean, it's no secret that this is a case where the internet will pick every single thing apart. So I completely understand you wanting to clarify a few things. And there's just been so much said over the years that it's, I think at this point, even for me, sometimes it's hard to get the facts straight because I've heard a million different things over the years. So I appreciate all the clarification. All right, we're moving on to theories, which my goodness, the amount of questions where people wanted answers on specific theories or what you thought, which was answered in in episode eight. Please go back and listen to that if you haven't already. But let's get into theories. Is it possible that Maura's trip was completely spontaneous and that's why no one knew that she was going? Maybe she was going to search for a car on her own. Yeah, this is a another great question. And, you know, by all appearances, her quote unquote plan seemed very last minute, very spontaneous. She didn't tell anyone. And I I mentioned that in the podcast. And if she did tell anyone, hey, Julie, Kathleen, Dad, Freddie, Curtis, I'm going to take this car and drive to New Hampshire, we would have immediately said, that's a terrible idea. It's not safe. Do not do that. So I think she knew that, that it wasn't a good idea. Um, And maybe this is just me thinking, maybe that's why she didn't tell anybody. But again, until we find Mara, I, I don't know. In terms of her potentially going to New Hampshire to search for a car, I don't see that because that's a long way to go. And the location that she was in is, you know, you don't need to travel two plus hours to go find a car. You can go right down the street in Massachusetts. But what I will say is we do know based on her phone records that she was calling classified ads for used cars. So she was trying on her own in some capacity to find a new car. 
as well as going car shopping with my dad. That was my first thought is maybe she saw a Craigslist ad for maybe her dream car or something that was more affordable or even maybe just something that was like cooler than what she had and she was going to meet with somebody. Yeah, I mean, that that's possible too. I mean, it, there's so many possibilities and that's part of the draw of Mara's case is until we find Mara, it's hard to rule out anything. And it seems like a terrible idea, but she was also making poor decisions leading up to her disappearance. She was, her behavior was, was not characteristic of her. I'll be the first to say that. And for her to get in that car and drive all that way to New Hampshire was a bad decision. And, you know, I just don't know what her mindset was and why she would do something like that. She was too smart for that. So she was human and she was very flawed as we all are and um, young and you know, made made some poor decisions. Oh, absolutely. I, I am so happy that nobody had a microscope on my life when I was 21. My goodness. The next theory question is, how do you feel about the tandem driver theory? Well, there's no evidence to suggest a tandem driver. Mara didn't call anybody to coordinate that we know of on her cell phone because we have her cell phone records. And to my knowledge, she didn't email or instant message anybody to put together a plan. So how would she have coordinated that? Yeah. Throw it in the the bucket of uh, so many theories that we just can't answer, right? I mean, to your point, there's so many possibilities. Now, we did get some more pointed questions about, you know, specific theories, specific people. Why do you think Maura turned down Butch's offer for help? Do you think she would have been hesitant to call your family, her family, for help? Yeah, well, there's my thought process is she could have still been in shock from the accident. And, you know, we know the airbags deployed. We know the windshield was cracked. She may or may not have been drinking. So I've always thought she probably didn't have a plan formulated yet when Butch came upon her because it was pretty quick after the first 911 call that Butch was there on scene. And the other thing I've thought about is maybe she didn't realize she didn't have cell service. So if Butch came before she opened her phone and realized I have no communication, it's it's a hard one because, you know, I don't know if she already knew she didn't have cell service because that doesn't make sense. If she knew she had no communication and then turned down help, that doesn't make sense to me. But if she didn't know, then that makes a little more sense where she declined his help and was like, oh, I'll just get out of this situation myself and then realize, oh, I'm stuck. I have no way out. And then accept the next offer of help. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. Next question, were the Loon Mountain 3 ever questioned? I know that the Loon 3 were questioned by law enforcement. Or they said they looked into it. So yes, that avenue has been explored. We also got an overwhelming amount of questions about psychics. That was on social media. That I mean, I I feel like I'm seeing that pop up everywhere. So for the record, have you or your family ever gone to a psychic? And what was the result? Yes. When you're in a situation like my family has been in, nothing's off the table. So we did consult with several different psychics over the years. But the bottom line is Mars is still missing. I feel the same way. I went to like a million psychics and I feel like you get a ton of different answers. And in the end, to your point, you're like, well, my person is still not out there or they are out there, but we don't have the answers, right? Um, so I feel it. I, I, I think people want the these psychics to come through with some solid answers and I totally get it. But I think that this is just the reality of families and true crime is like most of us are super open to it. We've tried and just haven't gotten the answers that we were seeking. If you could have one question answered 100% truthfully based on all current available evidence, who would you ask and what would you ask of them? This is probably up there in my top favorite questions because I know the answer. And I want to ask Mara, where was she going? If I could get that answer, you know, 
you don't, I can't tell you how many nights I've just sat there staring at the ceiling thinking, what the heck, Mara? Why were you doing that? Why were you in New Hampshire? What was your plan? Where were you going? So I want that question answered. Yeah, I think that would give us all the answers. Absolutely. All right. Last theories question. Do you think Mora is still alive and in Canada? All right, let's move on to the media impact, because, of course, that's what media pressure is all about. That's why the podcast is named Media Pressure. It was designed to feature cases as told by those who know them best, who know the victim or survivor at the center of the story and discuss the media pressure one way or the other. Right. They either have had extreme media pressure, like in your case, or they're in need of media pressure. Because these things dramatically change the way that cases go, in my opinion. And as we know, media pressure can move mountains. And I think we've seen that. We'll get to tips being generated from the podcast, but we have to go one question at a time. So let's get into the media impact. Mora has one of the largest dedicated group of followers. What are the highs and lows of this? And how do you navigate such attention? So it's... It's a balancing act, right? On the one hand, we are screaming for that media attention so that Mara is not forgotten about. But on the other hand, you get the scrutiny from people online and people become obsessed and they want to just tear apart anything that you say and try to catch you in something when you know, once you hear the podcast, it's very evident that my family is just trying our best to find Mara and to have every little thing that we say come under a microscope is hurtful, some of it and unfair, but it, it comes with the territory because we're going to have to expect some of that if we put ourselves out online. And if we continue to advocate for our missing loved ones, and it's just the the price that you have to pay. And I guess, you know, it's just hurtful. Some of some of the things that have been said. Yeah, absolutely. And you guys are so open. You know what I mean? It just it, it surprises me knowing your family now. It's just It's so sad, but I do think that the podcast is changing things and we'll get into that, which is so exciting. The next question, which I think is a great question and and kind of kind of hard to answer. If there was only one thing you could clear up about Maura's case, what would it be? Well, there's been a lot said over the years, but I think probably the most egregious, hurtful thing that's been said is that Maura was running away from her family. And If you listen to the podcast, you can see how ridiculous that statement is. And it's just so hurtful because that's so far from the truth. And, you know, I could go on and on about all the the, the things that have been said, but I think that one is, is the most hurtful. Yeah. I mean, 
like, I understand that you guys had these really high expectations, or I should say, your dad had these really high expectations for you guys in terms of sports and trying your best and being upstanding citizens. But it's so clear that he was so supportive of you guys, and especially Mara, uh, you know, after all she was going through, for her to crash the car and him be like, no problem, we're going to figure it out as long as you're safe. Like, that is such a kind, wonderful response to what happened that I'm right there with you. I try not to theorize on cases, but I don't see why she would run from you guys, especially when your dad was so willing to do everything in his power to help her clear these problems for her. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah. And I think that's another aspect of the podcast that's really illuminating for some people because it is like inviting the public into our living room and you get a glimpse of our family dynamics and there's always banter and we disagree on a lot of things, but we're real. We're real people. We're, we're humans. And like I said in the podcast, we're not these monsters or characters that people have painted us out to be online. And in listening to the conversations between my brothers and my dad, you can, you can see that that's, that's evident. Yeah, a thousand percent. And and from somebody on the outside looking in, I mean, I know that we've been friends for quite some time now, but going to that 20 year anniversary, I will say selfishly that there were points during that that I was like, wow, I wish this was my family. I wish I had what Maura had for my sister, Alyssa. And I was jealous and I was envious. And it made me really, really sad at certain points. Of course, that was all bundled with being happy for you and happy to be there and happy to meet everybody. It's just this calamity of feelings. But overall, I was like, wow, this family cares. And if every family operated like this in true crime, I think that these cases would be forever positively impacted. So for whatever that's worth, I just wanted to let you know that. I've never told you that before. No. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, don't get me wrong, we, within my family, we disagree on a lot of things. We definitely disagree. I mean, I, I disagree with some of the things my dad wants to do or approaches, but at the end of the day, we're all there for one reason, and that is Mara. And so we, you know, we disagree, we have a little argument, and then we move on because we can't dwell in our disagreement. And who cares about being right? or wrong. You know, it's just, we need to find Mara still. And so having that strong family bond and that dynamic is helpful too, because, you know, I've been able to persuade my dad out of certain approaches. And I've also been able to listen to why he wants to go about something or pursue a certain lead a certain way. And it's, it strengthens us as a team and we need we can't all just be you know yes dad yes dad you know i i hardly ever say yes dad that's a good idea so <laughs> uh, obviously from the podcast you can you can hear that i love my dad and so did mara and so does everybody else in my family but that doesn't mean that we always have to agree and we don't yeah so the next question is something that I grabbed from the deep pits of the internet because I, I kept seeing this come up again and again and again because I have absolutely monitored conversations about the podcast, about the case, because I am just forever interested in one, knowing the public's reaction to families in true crime and specifically this podcast because I'm extremely invested in it. But one of the things that I kept seeing come up again and again and again that I thought we should just address head on because I know how you feel about this, is that this accusation that you and other members of your family are just sugarcoating who Mora was, that you're not able to see her flaws, that you can't understand how deeply troubled she was. So I just wanted to talk about that. Like, how do you feel about that? Because I feel that you were extremely fair in the podcast. But of course, I'm the executive producer and I'm a little biased. How do you feel about that? I thought it was very important to talk about some of her mistakes. I, I tried not to sugarcoat it. I'm her sister. Of course, I'm a little biased. That's That comes with being her sister. But I'm not going to tell you that Mara was perfect and she made mistakes and she had flaws. And I wanted to highlight some of those to kind of, 
get people to be able to understand her more and relate to her. You, I can't tell you how many messages I got saying, I struggled with the same thing. I also went through a difficult time where I just needed to get away and I drove somewhere and I didn't tell anyone, or I also had an eating disorder, or I also knew what it felt like to be in a competitive nursing program. Messages like those, uh, it just overwhelmed me because that is kind of what I talk about in episode eight was empathy. And hearing other people be able to relate to this person who they otherwise saw as a character, now being able to relate to her as a fellow human being who made mistakes and had flaws, I think that was powerful. I didn't want to sugarcoat her at all. And I tried to just put it out there and be vulnerable and talk about some of these things that are you know, some of them are her were her private struggles, but in order to fully understand Mara as a human being, it was important for me to talk about those things, and I did. Yeah, I, I thought you addressed them pretty head on, and I think that the, that's what makes this podcast so special, right? Is that it's finally for the first time ever from you and your family's perspective. If you want to go hear what somebody else thinks from somebody who never met Mora, go listen to any other production about her. That's not what this podcast is about. And you and I talked about that really early on, right? That that basically the entire concept is the case from your point of view as you experienced it and, and all the repercussions that come with that. So we are not saying that this podcast, that this season about Mora or any future season of this podcast is going to be completely unbiased. That's not the point. You've heard these stories from absolutely everyone else. Now it's time to hear it from people who know it best, who lived it. So that's the entire point of the podcast. And I think that you did a good job addressing really both sides of that, because of course, it's your sister. You see things so differently. And I, I don't know, it just, it drives me a little crazy. So I really wanted to to just address it head on because I think people are almost thinking that you're avoiding that question when I see it as you addressing it head on. Yeah. And it it gives credibility to the podcast and to the story for me not to highlight some of those mistakes and some of those struggles wouldn't be telling the full story. And so I I think people, the majority of people see that. And that's why I got all of those messages. Yeah, those messages are the best. It's one of the, the best parts of this whole process. And so I have a few questions I'm inserting here because I wanted to talk to you about it. So one of the reasons that I wanted to feature Maura's case in this podcast, really first too, is specifically because of all the hate that you guys have gotten. I mean, it it breaks my heart and I've seen it unfold over years now. And so thinking of just what are powerful stories to tell in true crime about the impact of media pressure, positive and negative on these cases, you were the first one that came to mind. And I wanted to ask too, because the podcast has been so extremely well received. I think more than we expected, to be totally honest. I think we were both a little afraid, but it was so well received. And I want to ask one, how does that make you feel? Because I have seen you change so much in this process. At least I think so. I think that you've changed. I think that you've blossomed because I know that you were scared. To put this out. So these are a lot of questions piled together, but like, how does it make you feel that it was so extremely well received? You know, with you being scared in the beginning, has that changed? Are you still scared? And how does it feel to finally just get all this out? I mean, it feels amazing to have that support because like you, when you first approached me, I was like, are you sure you want to cover Mara? Like, are you sure Mara should be the first season? Because you know, you know, as well as I, what happens whenever somebody talks about Mara. And so I was, I was scared. I, I knew that there are people out there that want me and you to fail. Yeah, absolutely. They want us to fail. They don't want us to not so much not have a voice, but they, they don't want us to be validated And that's kind of crazy to me because all I'm doing, all I set out to do was to talk about my experience and to talk about this this sister that I knew. And 
I didn't know how people would receive it. I, I, you know, I thought that there would be negative comments for all kinds of reasons and not the typical negative comments that you're going to get for any podcaster, you know, your monotone or your boring or your voice is horrible. <laughs> you know, I knew I, I'd get some of that, but I don't care about that. I was more concerned about how was the content going to be received and to have that reception. It just made me so proud. And since we launched it, I've just kind of every day taken a big breath of air and just let it out. And I feel so relieved, like I did it, we did it. And now it's out. And that's kind of the wave that I've been riding for the past eight weeks is just like, wow, it's finally out there. Because of course, I worked on it for a long time. And there was that anticipation that built up and me nitpicking myself like crazy. And even when I listen back to some of the episodes, I'm like, oh, I screwed up here or there or there. <laughs> but nobody cares about that. And I'm the only one that cares. So that was a concern for me. You know, I wanted it to be really, really well done, really well written so that it was something that I could be proud of and my family to be proud of. And what I can say now is that we accomplished that. We're proud of this product that, that we put out. Yay. That makes me so happy. I'm like, I'm on the verge of tears right now because I it's like all I ever wanted for you and your family is to have your own space carved out here and a space full of love and people supporting you and, and not being awful to you. Yeah. And one, one thing I'll add is if it isn't glaringly obvious, I am an introvert. I don't <laughs> like... <laughs> to do all these interviews and podcasts and all of all of the stuff that I've had to come out of my comfort zone to do because I am a private person. I'm introverted. I get really anxious and stressed out. You know, I mean, nervous to talk to you, you know, before this, I was nervous to talk to you and I'm like, it's Sarah. But it's just because I put a lot of responsibility on myself because I want and knew that if Mara was going to be the first season, not only did I have a responsibility to do right by Mara, I also had a responsibility to make sure the first season of media pressure was set up for success so that other victims and families could have the space and the comfort level to tell their stories and not be afraid and, and not look at, you know, what Julie did or what the Murrays did and how much they got attacked for whatever they said. And so that's why the the writing and the scripting, you know, I spent hours and hours toiling over each word to make sure it was was right. And I made so many changes throughout the process. But that was that double responsibility that I felt. Yeah. I mean, and I'm like, I'm gonna cry. I knew it was gonna happen. Um it's just I'm so happy for you, to be totally honest. That's all I ever wanted for you guys was to be able to to stop getting the hate 24 seven and having everything nitpicked apart. And I think that you just telling this story has really quelled people down, but, but that's how I see it. So I wanted to ask you, do you think that you finally coming out and saying this and your dad and your brothers being involved, do you think that it's kind of calmed people down a little? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing people make comments saying, that they think that part of their engagement online and on social media has been negative because they did see my family as these characters and they finally realized that we're just regular humans like you trying to do the best that we can in a tragic situation. And a lot of the trolling and just um, harassment has really, really eased up. And I'm hoping it's not just this window of time. I hope that continues going forward, but it, it has given my family some peace. I love that. I love that so much. Now, I put it under this media impact section, this next question, because it was it, it's a popular question that's coming up a lot, Julie. People want to know, are you ever going to write a book about Mora? I have seriously considered it stay tuned ah! 
Yeah, okay. We're going to stay tuned. We are going to stay tuned. And now we will move on to our resolution section. So people want to know, could you file a civil suit against the New Hampshire PD? That's a good question. I mean, potentially, I guess we could. Of course, I talk about the court case in the podcast, episode seven. So that is an avenue that we we pursued in the past. But right now, people need to remember that Mar is still missing. And so there's still leads coming in. There's still an investigation that needs to be done and, and carried out. And so that's our main focus. And the other part to that is my relationship with the new law enforcement team has improved significantly. And we're sharing information. They're returning my calls and emails. I mean, small little things like that. So I'd rather work side by side. I'd rather work collaboratively than, you know, go after them and have them spend time not focusing on the 130 plus unsolved cases in the state of New Hampshire. So that's kind of my mindset right now with that. Yeah, things are good. You just want to keep going how it is. That makes total sense to me. We had a question about what is the status of the blood found in the the A-frame house closet? Another good question. The samples that were taken from the A-frame closet were too degraded to pull any DNA off of. And there was multiple different groups that have gone into the A-frame because the owners were gracious enough to let us go in. And at one point, some wood paneling got taken from the inside downstairs closet under the stairwell. And that wood paneling is what was tested in the oxygen series that was put out in 2016-17. And they actually show it in the lab where they were able to identify it as positive for human blood, but it was too degraded to link to one individual. But they did say it was blood from a male and a female, which, I mean, it, it just makes my head spin that there's blood in this closet. But that's kind of where we are with, with that. Yeah, yeah. It, so many possibilities. Now, we did get a lot of questions about the 20-year vigil and how that was, because that it, the 20-year vigil happened while the podcast was coming out, which was insane. Of course, I already talked about how I went, but how did you think the 20-year vigil went after going to every other vigil and planning all those other vigils? Well, I thought it was just absolutely beautiful from the setup to the people that were there in that room. Everything went smoothly to see all those different people just, I love to see the interaction between the the people that attended, because some of them had never met the, the other people that they communicate with online and have done so for years. And to see people interact and just to feel the love in that room was something that I will never, ever forget. Yeah, it was fantastic. I've been to a lot of vigils for a lot of families and the turnout was the biggest I've ever seen. I mean, it's just in- incredible, the, the support that surrounds you guys. Yeah. And I I do have to do a shout out to Light the Way, who are amazing advocates. And they helped me every step of the way to plan that vigil and make sure everything was just perfect. And then Curtis's partner, Sarah, she stepped up in a big way and kind of served as MC when I was, you know, freaking out or being anxious about something. (laughs) Um, And so that was awesome. And Everybody else, I mean, there, there's too many to, to thank, but the people that showed up and the people that helped, and it, it was just an amazing event. And I was so happy that my dad was able to feel that love because, you know, he is 81 now, and I never want him to think that people have forgotten about Mara and don't care. And for him to be in that room and feel that was so, so powerful. And I, he, he and I discussed it afterwards. And I got the sense that he left the vigil feeling like this is the most support that we've ever had. Wow. Yeah. And so to have that vigil just go so smoothly, there was no issues with the neighbors. There was no issues with anybody going on private property. 
it was just, it was just for Mara. And I am just, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm about to cry because I mean, he's having to talk about my dad. I cry because I love him so much. Um, <laughs> Everyone loves he, him. That's clear from the feedback on the podcast. Everyone loves your dad. So understandable. Yeah. yeah. And Mara did too. Mara love that man. Yeah. So it was just an amazing event. I could go on and on and on about it, but the the launch of the podcast leading right into the vigil and then all the news media just gave my family just this feeling of we are supported. And that is so that was so impactful is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, really a shout out to all the creators who have covered Mora's case and were kind enough to promote this show. I think that that's really cool. I was really excited to see just how many creators wanted to support you, support me. Like that's what it's all about. So you guys know who you are. Shout out. You guys have seen them post about media pressure. It's just so amazing when we can come together as a true crime community to support these cases and kind of take that personal stake out of it a little bit. Like, you know, I know I have an episode on Mora. Here's a new show from her sister. I'm going to promote it. So I, I just love that. I think that there was so much love in this launch and so many unexpected promotions <laughs> that we were so excited about. Also, the billboard in Times Square. When you told me that there was a possibility we could get a billboard in Times Square, I was like, she's, she's, there's no way. How could that happen? And then I remember you, you, text me and you're like it's happening tomorrow and I was just like what <laughs> Ow. surprise yeah that was awesome yeah that was really cool it, I wanted that like more so than even just the promotion of the podcast which of course obviously we have to promote the podcast I wanted that for you and your family you know to like the whole world is seeing Maura right now she's literally in Times Square in New York I just wanted you guys to have that, to have the the picture in the video and just, I, I'm so glad that that made you happy because I feel like it's so hard. You know, all of us families are out there kind of competing in this space, trying to make our loved one the loudest and it's it, an exhausting, almost impossible race. So I'm so glad that made you happy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Getting back into questions. So... Of course, everybody wants to know, where does the case stand today? Well, the case is still with the New Hampshire State Police, and they're treating it as a suspicious missing person case. So that's the classification. And I reconfirmed that this past November 2023, when I met with the chief of the cold case and the assistant attorney general in New Hampshire. So that's where it is. Mara was entered into the FBI's FICAP program a couple of years ago. And that's, you know, that goes right along with it being a suspicious missing person case because not all missing people get entered into FICAP. So that's another resource that um, law enforcement is using, as well as on the 20th anniversary or the 20th vigil there was an age progress photo released of her. So it was just another tool. It's more of a protocol at this point. They did the same thing for Brianna Maitland recently on her 20th vigil. So, you know, I feel good about where the investigation is going. And I feel, like I said before, I feel good about my relationship with law enforcement. Yeah, of course. And I think one of the most exciting questions, because I already know the answer to it, is have you gotten any new leads since the podcast came out? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We have gotten so many. We have a PI on board and he is overwhelmed uh, with leads and tips. And so if you're listening and you know something, keep them coming. We can never get enough. It only takes one to maybe break this case open. So that was another reason for doing the podcast is to generate a new interest in a 20-year-old case. And it's certainly, certainly doing that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think some of the conversation I saw online was, you know, what more could be said about Mora's case or what could creating another podcast about Mora possibly do? And it's like this, this right here. This is why we don't stop talking about our people because these tips continue to come in. So it's like, for me, that aside from, you know, everything that your family has gone through, you know, this is the beauty of it too, is retelling these stories so many times in so many different ways that you get new leads. 
Yep, exactly. Yeah. Media pressure. Media pressure moves mountains. I don't just say it for marketing. I've said it long before I ever knew I was going to turn it into a podcast. I think another great question that people are asking, what can people do to help? And especially if they're local, what can they do to help? This is probably the most asked question that I get, one of the most asked questions. And the answer seems a little underwhelming, but I tell people, keep talking about the cases, keep talking about Mara, because we need that awareness. Um, We need her to be in the public consciousness. If there is a perpetrator, we need them to know that we are not stopping. And by continually talking about her, that is so, so valuable. And it's easy to do. And I think people are like, that's it. I want to do more. But that's huge. And you can attest to that. Yeah. And your advocacy for all of these cases. Oh, a thousand percent. I mean, and I get it. Sharing feels so uneventful and so boring when it comes to a missing person case. Like, I understand, like, people want to be boots on the ground. They want to go out there helping. They want to even, like, fold T-shirts for a vigil, right? They want to be hands-on. But sharing is so, so impactful because even major news outlets, they're going to pick up these cases that are the most shared that everybody's talking about. They want to pick up on what's trending because they know that it's going to get clicked and shares. So that's the value in sharing and getting it trending and getting people talking about it is every single case that is blown up in the media started with a single share. And I know that's kind of like crazy to think about, right? If, if you look at even your sister's case, right? Gabby Petito, any case that has become larger than life in the media started with one share. And you can be a part of that. And, you know, and I think that that is insanely impactful and such a low lift that every single person listening to a podcast can do for every single case. I couldn't agree more. Yep. (laughs) I feel like I talk about it all the time. Like I could sit here and preach about sharing all day. Of course, you know, people want to know, do you think Mora will be found? Yes, I do. And I have to, because the minute you lose hope, you go into a dark place. And I also owe that to Mara. Like I cannot just stop. I cannot continue to advocate for not only her, but for others because we need to find her. We will find her and we're not going to quit. Yeah. Do you, do you ever feel like what you've done for Mora is kind of an, a form of active grieving? That's how I felt with creating my sister's podcast was like, I am so frustrated that there's nothing I can do about it, that I'm going to do something because it puts me at peace. And for, for me, after all these years, I don't, this could be a real term out there, but I just kind of coined it active grieving because doing something always made me feel a lot better than just sitting there and being sad about it. Yeah, I love that term. And it, it is true. It's it's hard for people to understand if they haven't been in our shoes, but sometimes when you're not doing anything, you get this feeling of guilt. And I think you and I actually talked about that before, where you constantly are thinking, okay, I need to be doing more. I need to be doing something. What can I do? I just can't sit here. I just can't wait for my phone to ring from law enforcement. I need to be active and, and trying to find answers. And that motivates you and it motivates other people too. And it, it does, in a way, kind of help with the grieving process because you're not sitting there feeling sorry for yourself. Doing, the act of doing is, is really helpful. Um, and it has been for me in, in terms of grieving Mars loss. Yeah. I think, of course, like both of us respect however anybody wants to grieve in any way. And I think we can both certainly understand that this path is not for everybody. It's an extremely difficult, um, it's weird, right? Because it's almost traumatizing and therapeutic at the same time when you go through it. At least that's how I felt. So we are not, I think, shaming anybody for how they handled their person's case. But I know, I think for both of us, going through this extremely difficult process has been healing in a weird way that I certainly didn't expect when I set out to make a podcast about my sister. Yeah. And that's a great point. I mean, look at just my own family. There's my two brothers who have not been as public and that's their choice. And just having them come on the podcast 
has been therapeutic for them because they were able to to you know tell their story and do they want to be on social media posting all the time every day no but they don't have to because there's usually not always but there's usually someone that's better suited for that and i just happen to be that person within my family and it just works it works well for us yeah yeah usually i see families all the time pick one person as a, a family advocate or a media advocate if you will so absolutely now Another really popular question is people want to know that after Mora is found, because we are thinking positively, we are manifesting that Mora will be found, will you continue to advocate for other families? Absolutely. 100%. And I still try to balance as much as I can an active investigation, social media, my dealings with law enforcement, and my job. Um, I still try to do all that. But I think it's, Part of going through something like this is finding meaning and I think in purpose. And I think obviously I have 20 years of experience and there are other families going through the same thing that I have gone through. And so I'm so happy when I get messages from other family members, you know, asking things like how to deal with media or how do I know who to trust and, and things like that. That brings me so much joy. I know it sounds cheesy, but it's so true. I don't think it's cheesy at all, obviously. I love that. Along that same vein, really, people want to know, like, what's next for you? You've done the podcast. You know, you've dove into the case. Now you are not just an interviewee in true crime. You have created your own content. So what's next for you? Yeah, well, I'm going to continue tracking down all the leads and tips and continue to actively try to find Mara, continue to help other families and victims in any way that I can, continue to shine a light on the need for empathy in true crime. And I think the response from episode eight was very eye-opening um, because I just assumed, you know, I'm I'm in this bubble and I'm I just assumed everyone knew that, you know, everyone knew about the lack of empathy, but people did not. And in telling the story, it was really eye-opening for some people. And so that motivated me to want to do more um, because there's more people that can be reached. And I want to get that message out to as many people as I can, because it's so, so important for true crime to have empathy in there. And, and we just, we're not there yet. We're definitely trending in that direction. And so I want to continue to promote that. I also have a couple of exciting projects coming up in the future. Excited to work on those. And, and that goes back to actively grieving. You know, after the end of media pressure, after it was all wrapped up and all the editing was done and everything, it was like, okay, what next? And it's like, okay, I need to do something else. So, of course, I've picked up other projects. And so that is what I will be doing. And I can't wait to share that with the world. I can't wait either. <laughs> I'm like, I have no chill. I'm like, I can't wait. I'm so, I'm like legitimately so excited. Now, shifting gears, right? I mean, we're still in the same vein here, but oh, and we're going to get into this because this is one of the most emotional parts of the vigil for me. I was bawling my eyes out. But people want to know, what's something you want to say to Mora if you knew that she could hear you right now? Well, I, I said it in the last episode, and it's simple. I love you, and I'm not giving up, and I'm going to continue to work towards finding you until I don't have any breath. And so that's what I'm going to do. And everyone in my family feels the same way. We're all we're all in line with that as our uh, motivation and our guide. But like you said, you know, I I was asked. I never thought about addressing Mara directly in 20 years, and it terrified me. Absolutely terrified me because. It's scary. It's scary. You know, I've had many silent conversations with Mara, like thousands, but to put it on paper and to think about what I would say, that terrified me probably more so than doing the podcast. Um, so 
I'm I'm glad and I'm happy that it was actually like the way that suggested I do that and encouraged me. And so that's what I did. Yeah, we love Light the Way. And I can tell that it's still like so emotional for you, which is why I, I wanted to ask you about it, right? I was like, I went to the vigil and you read this letter to Mora and I was shaking, crying. Like it, it was the most impactful thing I think I've ever heard you say. And maybe that's just because I'm a big old softy and it's all emotional for me. But to hear you read this letter to her and address her directly was just so emotional for me that I I knew that if you were comfortable with it first, that I wanted to share it with the listener. Because I was like, if they feel a fraction of how I feel right now, I just, I want them to hear it and not only humanize Mora and all of this, but humanize you after so many years of just ups and downs in the media and your family being treated awfully at times. I just wanted people to hear it. And I am so, so gracious and thankful that you agreed to that. So for for some people that might be confused right now, that's what we want to play for you, is this audio of Julie reading this letter directly to Mora. Maza, today is February 9th, 2024. On this day 20 years ago, you disappeared. We still don't know how or why, but we have never stopped looking for you. I'm reading this letter to you publicly, to a ton of people who have grown to love and support you. Some I've never even met. Most you've never met. You'd be amazed at how your smile has united such a wide array of people from all over the world. You would love them. Some started entire groups dedicated to finding you. Others organized searches for you multiple times a year. Every year. Some advocate for you tirelessly online and in the media. Others offer us a sounding board to voice our frustrations. It truly is an amazing diverse group, all relentless in finding you. On a personal level, I broke up with that guy I told you about. You would have supported that decision, I'm sure. I got out of the army and opened a gym, bought a house, had a miscarriage, and spent a whole lot of my time on this thing called social media. It's wild, and I don't think you would like it. I still hike and camp, but it's not the same without you. Nothing is the same. No one gets me quite like you did. My quirks and sense of humor, dumb jokes that you were always quick to point out. No one gives me as much smack as you did either. I miss that, probably the most. Both mom and Kathleen passed away from cancer way too young. Mom on your birthday. She was on life support for longer than the doctors anticipated. I know in my heart she was holding off until May 4th. She never stopped thinking about you. Kathleen passed on Thanksgiving Day. Before she passed, we looked at old photos of you together. One of my biggest regrets is not taking more photos. Because 20 years later, that's all we have. And you know as well as I, mom and dad's camera skills were terrible. So most of them are blurry or off-center. Curtis, Sarah, and Freddie are doing well. You never met Sarah, but I know you'd love her. This past Christmas, we listened to old songs from one of your playlists. I have to admit, and we all agree, you had impeccable taste. Dad's entire life has been dedicated to finding you. We talk about you every single day. He's still stubborn as hell and pretends not to know where the seatbelt is and tells the exact same stories you've heard 8,000 times. I wish you were here to help me give him the business like we used to do. Recently, I hosted a podcast telling your story. It was really difficult, but we got through it. I hope we did you proud. In closing... I have so many questions for you and so much to tell you. But the most important message I want to convey is that we love you and miss you something terrible. We will never stop fighting for you. Never. My hope is that you, Mom, Kathleen, and Nana are smiling down on us. For one day we shall see each other again, perhaps in a different... perhaps in a different universe. Until then, you can count on me. 
I promise you that. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of my sister, Mara Murray, please contact the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit at 603-223-3648 or visit maramurraymissing.org. Special thanks to my friend Sarah Turney, whose trust and guidance made this project possible. Media Pressure is a Voices for Justice media original and is executive produced by Sarah Turney. This series includes original music from my brother, Curtis Murray, as well as Blue Dot Sessions. I'm your host, Julie Murray. For more information about Media Pressure, visit mediapressure.com. For more information about my sister Mara's case, visit maramurraymissing.org.